they say that there are two ways to interpret a book, like the Bible. The correct way is called exegesis, and the incorrect way is called eisegesis. Exegesis is taking meaning out of the book. It's receiving the message. Eisegesis is taking your own message and, um, and placing it into the book. So eisegesis is basically hearing whatever it is you want to hear. You know, because you could have practically any belief, value, or opinion, and with a quick Bible search, you could probably find a verse or two that backs you up. And the Bible's a big book, after all. But the problem with that little strategy is finding something in the Bible doesn't actually prove anything unless you're willing to really listen to what the text is saying. So you could say that eisegesis is a failure to respect the literature by refusing to learn what the book is trying to offer. So I recently read The Infancy Narratives by Pope, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, and in his introduction he says that good exegesis, again, receiving the message, has two stages. The first stage is asking what the author intended to communicate to his original audience. Okay, so it's the historical component. It's about understanding the past. Good. But Pope Benedict says very clearly, you can't stop there. Good exegesis can't just stop in the past. That second stage of exegesis is asking yourself, is what I have read true? How does this concern me today? And given that the ultimate author of the Bible is God, that means that second stage of exegesis will be ever-present and ever-new for all of us as we continue to live out our lives in a complicated and changing world while doing our best to love God and love our neighbor. Our gospel today provides a nice little example of how all of this is supposed to work. We heard today the Great Commissioning, uh, Jesus sending his disciples out two by two uh, to, to proclaim and prepare for the way for the kingdom of God. The historical component here is actually pretty easy. We read the gospel, and we learned how Jesus wanted his disciples to structure their mission. You know, go two by two. Don't bring money or an extra change of clothes. Say peace to the people that you meet, whether they accept it or not. So we read this gospel, and we get a little glimpse into what it was like for those disciples at that time. Like I said, that's pretty straightforward. It's that second stage of exegesis that I want to spend a little more time on. What is this gospel saying to us today? Let's go line by line, shall we? And in the interest of time, we won't do every single line. It was kind of a long gospel. Let's focus on the six most significant lines. The first one, the first important line, I'd say, go on your way, I am sending you into the world as lambs among wolves. And what this says for disciples of every era is that the world is a dangerous place. And we are not called to add to the violence. Sometimes that's necessary, I realize, you know, defending your country and all of that, 4th of July. However, our identity as Christians, that's not part of the job, you know, responding violence with violence. That's not what we're called to do. 
We're called to be harmless lambs in a place filled with predators. Second important line, carry no money bag, sack, or sandals. Hey, what this means for those disciples back then, for all of you, none of you, not one of you, requires a particular possession in order to do the work of God. Everything you need to act in the service of Christ is in your mind, on your lips, and in your heart. Third most significant line, probably the most familiar of it all. uh, First say, peace to this household. If a peaceful person lives there, it will rest upon them, and if not, it will return to you. And uh, really what that's saying is, even if a peaceful relationship is not established, there is value and grace in offering peace in the first place. Even if it's not accepted, even if the person throws it back in your face, it is noble and brave to offer peace to the people that you meet. That was true back then, it's true today. Uh, Fourth significant line, stay in that house, don't move about from one to another. I think that's pretty cut and dry. Focus on your work. Don't leave things half done. Do it right the first time. I feel like my dad when I say that. I probably sound like everybody's dad when I say that, huh? Do it right the first time. (laughs) Uh, The fifth one, fifth significant line. If a town does not receive you, then shake off the dust from your feet. And what this really means, vengeance is not your problem. If you are not welcomed somewhere, you should move on to some place that is more open to you Because it is pointless to lash out at people who don't accept you in the first place. It is better to leave them be in their stubbornness than to to fight them, you know? And how easily we can apply that, of all things, to our jobs, huh? If your company doesn't value or care about you in any way, well, maybe it's time to shake off the dust from your feet and find something more fruitful. I share that little anecdote because people talk to their priests a lot about their work troubles, so that's always fresh in my head. And finally, the last one, the sixth significant line, do not rejoice because the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That was the last line of our reading today, and it was probably the most important. Don't be proud of whatever power you happen to have. Don't rejoice as if you're better than other people. You should rejoice because God loves you and has prepared a place for you. That is why Christians should be happy people, no matter what the world throws at us. We are joyfully optimistic (laughs) because we know that God has got this and that everything really is going to be okay. At least that's how we're supposed to act. So I hope this puts things in perspective for you because I hate to spoil your fun, But none of you are going to literally live out this gospel reading. Sorry. None of you are going to walk barefoot to Beaver Dam or Hartford to proclaim the gospel to one household in exchange for room and board. Those days are over. However, every single one of us absolutely should be living out this gospel reading in our own way by being peaceful people in a violent world, um, by offering peace 
even when it's not accepted, by refusing thoughts of vengeance, even when we have good cause for that, and for letting ourselves rejoice in the fact that God walks with us on the journey of life. When we do that, when we do that, we are 